in three weeks time to see gold up over 200, almost $250. Then again, that doesn't happen. And, and to see it close the way it did on a Friday night, that doesn't happen. To see silver open up yesterday morning, 7% and trigger limit stops in China, that doesn't happen. Something is different. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're always glad to have this widely followed returning guest. Andy Schechtman is the CEO of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. He joins us for this weekly market update. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. Andy, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Great to be back, Don, again. Thanks for having me, buddy. It's been a long time. It's been this is three weeks, I think. Yes, our our uh, there's almost been a revolt among our subscribers and viewers. They've been, you know, shaking the 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 turrets and rattling the cages and banging the tin cups and saying, "Where is Andy Sheckman?" So we're glad to have you back. Welcome back to the U.S. soil after your tour of Europe. And so I understand you've you've had a lot of uh, interesting things happen there. Uh, maybe uh, every time you go to Europe, uh, gold will go up by a hundred bucks and silver by. Uh, uh, five bucks or something. Uh, we'll see. Actually, it's been almost two hundred dollars since we last spoke, and it's gone up two hundred bucks in about three weeks, which is just, you know, I, I and I don't mean to cut you off, but I did an interview with Big Square yesterday, and and he titled it "This Time Is Different" because I kept saying that, and and I don't know, man. I feel like, and I almost hate to say it, you jinx yourself, but it just feels like. This time is different. I've never seen anything like this. The resiliency, the strength. Sunday night, the market, bang, it goes straight down. And then I look five minutes later and it went from silver down 50 cents at the open to up 50 cents in a matter of minutes, up a dollar and, and gold down 20 to up 20. And then yesterday morning in Shanghai, silver opened up 7% limit, shut the, it triggered the stops in Shanghai and, and they stopped it, it went straight up 7%. Silver was up 10% last week, gold was up 3%. These are moves that in 34 years I've never seen and yet it continues to march higher and I wanna talk about that today. That's really what I, I wanna talk about because I, I read something and then it just dawned on me and you know maybe I'm, maybe I'm onto something, I don't know. Uh, but nonetheless, I do, I do think that that's something we should talk about. Any other questions that you have, too, I'm happy to, to entertain. But, you know, these are very interesting times. You, know, you also mentioned early in your travels that you were getting some insights from some uh, rather revealing meetings that you were having in different uh, European capitals there. So we'll be curious about that. Uh, if you want to, that'll be a teaser. You can whet our appetite for that. But uh, sure, go ahead and, and address, if you would, this well, I guess in the last three years, that's recently unusual movement of strength, sustained strength, I guess I would call it, in both the gold and silver markets. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just a little bit anecdotal, but, you know, go back to 1974, done again, when President Ford made buying gold legal again. The day after he did that, the Chicago Comex market opened up, the futures exchange. And if you look at it from the perspective of the government who said, fine, we'll let the people buy gold, but we can't let gold get out of control because gold is the antithesis of the system. Gold is the barometer by which we measure the health of a nation, uh, of their economy, of their currency. And, and so for a very, very long time, whether you're talking the London gold pool or any time after, it has been in the vested interests of the West to suppress the price of gold, to make the system seem stronger than it is, to support the illusion of a strong dollar, of a strong bond market, et cetera. And so the way that they did that was, I guess you could say, kind of smart. When you buy gold right now on COMEX, like as a dealer, like myself, if you have seven or eight thousand dollars in your margin account, that's it. Just in your margin account, you can control a 100 ounce gold contract. So uh, in essence, it's money that you're not even paying. The, the trade itself is just a handful of dollars, you know, five, eight, nine bucks, whatever for the trade. But the money in the margin account allows you to control the price of gold, 100 ounces per contract. And if the price keeps going up like it is here recently, you don't even have to pay any money. 
So the exchange came up with this idea, and that idea was, how about this? We will, instead of letting supply and demand fundamentals dictate the price of the market, where the more people who want to buy it, the higher the price goes, which is an inverse relation to the price of the dollar, let's do it this way. Let's create paper contracts with with massive rehypothecation so that you know you have one, two, three, four hundred claims on every single contract because really very few people have ever stood for delivery. And when the exchanges were formulated, you know, countries like China and India, these were third world countries. These were countries that did not have the ability to stand up to the West and to stand for delivery and and to do all of these things. So the West got together, all of the Western central banks, and hey, look, you guys, we can suppress the price of gold with a huge amount of leverage. We'll rehypothecate the contracts. And so we will make believe, in essence, that that. The contract holder owns the gold and the and the contract holder can make believe that he or she paid for it because they just have to have margin in their account. So the whole thing is just all make believe. But what it does is it allows the leverage of the COMEX with big pocket individuals to post large margin accounts and control copious amounts of metal. And if the if the leverage or if the margin never moves against them, in other words, the price doesn't fall down below the margin requirement. They never even have to pay for anything until they close out the account or take delivery. So it started to dawn on me that this is, is, is changing now. So why is it changing? It's changing because for 17 months in a row, China has been accumulating gold. And there was a report by BMO, an analyst at Bank of Montreal, who said the numbers that they're giving us, and Russia too, are, we believe, way below what they are actually accumulating. Not to mention they're the largest producers of it in the world. You look at what's happening in Switzerland, the the export numbers coming out of the refineries, massive amounts all going to China and to Russia and to Saudi Arabia and to these countries that ironically are in the BRICS. You look at what's happening on the Shanghai Exchange. On the Shanghai Exchange, you see silver priced at roughly three bucks an ounce higher, over $30 in China, and gold 70, 80 bucks higher. This is the arbitrage knob we've been talking about, slowly, slowly, slowly turning up the arbitrage. So the traders who have access to the LBMA, who have access to the COMEX and to the Shanghai Exchange can purchase in the West and deliver in the East. So what I am getting at is that I truly do believe, and that's why I say it feels different this time, that there is a possibility that they have lost control, they being the West, of being able to suppress the price of gold with naked futures contracts. They realize, perhaps, I'm not sure on this, but it sure feels that way, that they realize naked shorting copious amounts of gold and silver when the rest of the world is not only massively accumulating it, as the central banks have been doing for the last three years at, at record levels, mind you, but that there are willing participants willing to pay huge premiums to the fictitious, if you will, Western paper price and take delivery of it in China. And by naked shorting, you're ending up, I guess, setting up an infrastructure as dumb as a mud wall in a rainstorm. Because if all of a sudden these countries continue to stand for delivery, continue, continue, gimme, 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 it can bankrupt a company. And, and and if you don't believe that, just go back and listen to Chris Marcus's podcast with Bart Chilton, who admitted a week before he died that Bear Stearns went bankrupt because of silver going to $21 an ounce from nine, because they had such a, a massive short position, it bankrupt them. So, I guess what I'm simply saying is this, for my entire career, my entire life, the COMEX market has controlled the, the, the physical market. The paper market has controlled the physical market because of the leverage and because of the fact that very, 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 very few, less than 1% of all contracts issued stood for delivery. Now, in a world where we see massive industrialization and wealth in the countries that are accumulating it all, like China, like Russia, like Saudi Arabia, like all the countries in the Middle East, like all of the countries in the BRICS that are are, are growing in, in, in their wealth and in their middle class and in their industrialization. It's a different world. And they know that gold is remonetizing. They don't care 
about the relationship between real interest rates and the price of gold. They don't care about the strong dollar. They don't care about any of this stuff. They don't care about these correlations, right? They just want the gold and they don't care about technical analysis. They want the gold because gold is being remonetized all around the world. What is gold? Oh, that's right. It's the only other tier one asset in the world. Who's been buying it all? Oh, that's right. All of the central banks. And so they don't care about the traditional um, relationships, if you will, where, well, the dollar's going up and real interest rates are going up, so we should sell gold. No, they don't care because they know in a world where the world reserve currency has been weaponized and you have Janet Yellen going all around the world talking about confiscation of the 380 billion in Forex reserves of the Russians, we're going to confiscate it to fund the Ukrainian effort. Why the hell would anyone trust us? They won't. Not to mention, we've chosen inflation over austerity. We're, we're, we're accumulating a trillion dollars in debt every three months right now. And, 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 and our bond market has been a disaster. So my feeling is that as rates have gone higher, which is typically bad for gold, it's not. It's bullish for gold. Why? Because in this environment, to me, what the rising interest rate symbolizes is the rest of the world not wanting to buy our bonds, which will ultimately lead to monetization by the Fed. They will have no choice but to come in and backstop buying up all of the treasuries that no one else wants to buy. And, and all roads lead to the same place. And so I guess what I'm simply trying to say to you is that I believe there is a fairly decent chance. Now, it's almost foolhardy to say this. It's taken a big risk to say it because it's never been this way, but it almost feels like they have lost the ability to control the paper price of the commodities. Now, take another step back. What did China buy a few years ago? Oh, yeah, the LME, the London Metals Exchange, which is basically all the base metals, right? So it's not just precious metals. Have you noticed what copper's been doing? They're buying up all of the metals of the base metals uh, like copper and, and 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 rare earth metals like like nickel and zinc and aluminum and 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 everything. All the the soft commodities like like wheat and and soybeans and corn. This is what Zoltan Pozar said was going to happen. And if you look at what we talked about a week or two ago, or maybe three, I think I mentioned this to you. I just want to bring it up one more time. The interview that was done by the Kremlin aide Yuri Yushakov and, and where he talked about the new BRICS currency and, and said, yes, it's coming. And it will be a, a currency of two baskets. One, a basket of the local currencies of all of the countries involved. And number two, he said it would be a basket of commodities. But let me read to you, everyone, once again, what he said. We're going to put all of this into context. He says, the second part of this program is price. He says, for the moment, price is determined by Western speculation. We produce these commodities, we consume them, but we do not have our own price mechanism, which will balance supply and demand. During the COVID pandemic, the price of oil fell to nearly zero. Now we know that he was wrong with that. It was negative 40. It's impossible to make any strategic planning for economic development if you do not control prices of basic commodities. Price formation with this new currency should get rid of the Western exchanges of commodities. They know that we have been suppressing the price. They have been using this. I've been saying it over and over and over again. They have been using the suppression against us and, and, and taking delivery, draining the exchanges massively, draining the exchanges all around the world. You and I started talking about that in 2020 with the rise of the others, which are the, the sovereign wealth funds primarily. They are draining the exchanges. So they've gotten to the point where it's becoming harder to do that. And then they went to exchange for physical where they buy contracts in, in the West, move them to the, the LBMA and take possession of it there. That's getting harder to do. So what do they do now? They turn up the arbitrage sheet and say, we'll pay over three bucks an ounce more for your silver and 70, 80 more for your gold for now. Maybe it goes higher. But I, what I want people to understand is that if I were being completely forthright with a gun to my head and someone said, you tell me right now, man, is it different this time? And it feels different to me. It really, truly feels like they've lost the ability, at least with gold, to hold it back. Now, there is a 90% correlation throughout all of human history between gold and silver. And, and silver will come along for the ride. But 
in three weeks' time to see gold up over 200, almost $250. Dunning, and that doesn't happen. And and to see it close the way it did on a Friday night, that doesn't happen. To see silver open up yesterday morning 7% and trigger limit stops in China, that doesn't happen. Something is different. And I think the mechanism that was designed to control the prices of commodities worked in a world where the West ran supreme. But all of a sudden, lo and behold, the rest of the world has gained sophistication. They have gained uh, uh, wealth uh, and, and they have gained the ability to challenge the West on a on a financial status. And at least in terms of the commodities that are being suppressed and stand for delivery, it's changed everything. And I I feel that something's different. And, I, I you know, I, I, I'll just leave it at that. Happy to to take any questions you have in in that respect. I have two two reflections on what you just uh, said. One was a personal anecdote that that I've shared before that people will indulge me. I hope to uh, share again, and that's this: what you you painted a very vivid picture about one third of the way through there about the central banks of the East and everybody else except for the U.S. pretty much and and some of their closest allies. The central banks grabbing for gold, this 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 global metals grab, and not just gold, not just metals, but all uh, strategic natural resource commodities. It reminded me of the time that my wife and I just a year ago were in Florida intentionally during Hurricane Ian. We went to the big big box store ahead of time to load up on supplies. I filled my shopping cart. I couldn't get the regular bottled water because it was all the shelves were bare. And so I filled my my cart with expensive glass imported water bottles of kosher sparkling water, mineral water from wherever. And uh, and I was heading towards the checkout and it I, I watched other people eyeing my cart as I passed by. And I absolutely had to make a little decision in my mind. No matter what anybody said, if they told me I'll pay you $10 extra per bottle for what's in your cart, I wasn't going to stop. I was going to get this asset and get it where I needed it so that we could have that asset because it didn't matter to me at that point the price, it didn't matter to me the policy, it didn't matter anything. It just mattered about do you have the asset or don't you? That, that was observation. Yes, and that's why the central banks look at it right now. The other thing was this, you, you kept taking a step back, a step back, a step back to the bigger and bigger picture. I didn't, take, I didn't hear you take the final step, which I thought you were going to take, which is this idea that the East-West dialectic, this, this uh, dichotomy that's set up uh, that we have first within the U.S., we have the red team versus blue team uh, bickering and this, this bifurcation of the U.S. Are we going to split up? Are we going to have the great divorce? Are we going to have a second civil war, whatever? And then you back up, you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, who's pulling the chain? Who's, who's the puppet master with all these dancing marionettes? Because they're clearly not honoring the Constitution. They're clearly not honoring the, the, what's best for the people. So even, even this whole thing about BRICS versus the West seems to be, and some analysts have portrayed it as such, potentially another one of these uh, in created distractions. Now, I'm not saying they aren't real because there are real, as you've talked about, there's real consequences to, to uh, conflicts, but sometimes behind those conflicts is an advancement of a single singular agenda that is not being talked about, that's not being addressed. And wondering if uh, you have any thoughts about that is, is that even though we have the BRICS versus the West, uh, meanwhile, as we start to focus on that thinking, ah, now we've really got it, whether we're all just uh, in the hands of the globalists and we're all, because when you talk about price fixing, it's like, mm, wait a minute, they're going to free themselves from Western price fixing so that they can do Eastern price fixing. Like, Wait a minute. How is that? How is that a fundamentally different approach? So please take it from there. Because I don't think they intend to do Eastern price fixing per se. I mean, let, let me simply say this, that that in order for a new system to work, it will have to be transparent. It will have to be fairly priced. It'll have to be more of a cash and carry market. So when they de were deciding how do we design the COMEX, if they made it a cash and carry market, the price of gold and silver would be much, much higher and the price of the dollar would be much, much lower, just supply demand fundamentals. Instead, they decided to make it highly leveraged where multiple claims on a contract, you don't even have to pay for it. You can make believe to pay for it by having money in your margin account. And so this created an environment of, of tremendous leverage and, and rehypothecation. If it's a cash and carry market, largely like the Shanghai Exchange is, they do have a futures component, but it is largely cash and carry. Then the supply demand fundamentals come into place. You know, 
I guess it kind of bothers me that there are a lot of people out there that I think are probably even smarter than me, um, uh, that I respect a lot, that that dismiss in, entirely the concept of of the BRICS. Everyone focuses too much on the common settlement currency. That is a mistake. It will happen when it, when the time is right. Look, 36 more countries have formally applied. You're talking 46 countries potentially. They probably won't all make it, but north of 40, maybe 50. Who knows how many countries are admitted in October? You're talking the majority of human population, larger swath of, of global GDP already. Most of the, the rare earth commodities, most of the precious metals, most of the, I mean, they control everything you need, more of it than the West does. And not to mention bigger military might by far, two of the three largest nuclear arsenals, all of that stuff. People focus too much on the common currency because what they have been doing, and this is why there's such a rush for gold, because I believe they need the gold to transact business now cross borders. So I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, but what they've been doing is trading in local currencies. Like example, you know, uh, uh, Brazil, the second largest exporter of corn in the world, is now selling corn and soybeans to China for yuan and probably taking that yuan and converting it into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange for immediate cash and carry. They get kilo bars of gold sent to them. So you don't need – so with all of these countries using – their own currency for settlement or the the deal that Iran struck with with China to modernize their biggest airport, they're paying for it in oil. Uh, they're not paying for it in dollars. So all of these deals that are being set with local currencies chips away at the settlement value of the dollar. And and everyone's come back, well, the bond market, you know, the bond market is the most liquid and, and deep and this oh, bull crap already with the bond market. The bond market's a bunch of nonsense. And I'm going to read some stuff to you about that. But how's it done over the last year and a half uh, with the bond market? And do you know that there is a, 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 a deal right now going on? Well, let me get to the bond market in a moment because it's a big part of everyone's pushback against the bricks. Oh, the bond market, the bond market, the bond market. Part of the reason they <clears throat> they say that is the petro deal, the proceeds of all the money that was paid in dollars for oil, the, the excess goes into the bonds. Well, Who's been selling the bonds? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's those countries. And what have they been doing with it? Well, they've been buying more gold than at any time ever. And so as they shed bonds, they're buying gold, which has not only massively outperformed the bond market over the last decade, massively, but has no counterparty liability like sanction and confiscation risk, no default risk. As Doug Casey has always said, it is an asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. They are replacing bond holdings with gold holdings. They are replacing dollar settlement with local currency settlement. In essence, it is a new currency without it being a new currency. Every other country in the world just about has remonetized gold already. It is remonetizing. It is taking on a different viewpoint. But when we talk about the bond market, which has been just a joke recently, as we know, I want to read to you something that is deplorable and you know not enough people are talking about this but it will let me here it is right here okay so um i'm gonna read it straight up the international swaps and derivatives association isda is writing to the board of governors of the federal reserve system and the fdic the federal deposit insurance corporation and the office of the comptroller of the currency um, to urge the agencies to implement targeted reforms to the supplementary leverage ratio, the SLR, and enhance supplementary le leverage ratio framework. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it says, it calls for the exclusion of on balance sheet U.S. treasuries. In other words, what they're trying to do is say, you can load up on as many treasuries as you want. It's not going to be included in the leverage ratio. Well, how did that work over the last couple of years with the banks who loaded up on treasuries and then interest rates went up and it put banks out of business and has a whole bunch more teetering or the insurance companies teetering with these toxic bonds? And so basically what they are saying is the reform is seen as, a, as crucial to preserve the resilience of the U.S. Treasury markets, the U.S. economy and the international financial system at large. The bond market's a bunch of crap. And it's hanging on by a thread. And the rest of the people in the world see it for what it is. It is a tool of, of suppression. It is a tool of the ability of the West to run sanctions and to confiscate. 
as Janet Yellen said in Brazil, we need to confiscate this money and, and use it to fund the Ukrainian war effort. So look, as far as I'm concerned, the rest of the world says, why the hell would we ever buy these bonds when this is happening, when they can, not only when they can take our money and freeze it and sanction it, but it's, 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 it's performed horribly. It has all of these risks, including, you know, default risk. None of that applies to gold and the rest of the world is accepting gold and accumulating gold, which is what? Oh yeah, the only other tier one asset. And they've lost control of the pricing so much so that China and their market is willing to pay a 10% premium for any silver that the West is stupid enough to give away. And one other thing, when we talk about the ability to trade with one another, you know, a lot of stuff happens and no one is, is hearing about it. Let me pull up another quick article here um, that, again, you know, what was one of the first things I talked with you about? the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative, the largest infrastructure project in human history, 75% of, of human population, north of 50% of global GDP already. How many people have heard this? Probably no one, here we go. The Chinese government has just launched a new public blockchain infrastructure platform led by the Confluex Network. The platform, dubbed Ultra Large Scale Blockchain Infrastructure Platform for the Belt and Road Initiative, aims to offer an underlying public blockchain for cross-border applications, according to an April 1st post by the Confluix Network. The main focus of the project is to create a public blockchain infrastructure platform that will be able to support the implementation of cross-border cooperation projects along the Belt and Road Initiative. What did we just see in late 2023? The first ever cross-border digital gold, uh, gold um, trade using the digital yuan. So, when people talk about the SWIFT and the dollar and the bond market, they are just macro trends. People at the very end hang on too long. And this is going to create, I believe, a religious experience for these people who believe that this can't happen, that the West can never. Look at all the stuff that the West has done that you look and say to yourself, I never in my life thought I would see anything like this in this country. And yet it's all around us. Everywhere we look, socially, morally, economically, religiously, politically, geopolitically, everywhere we look. And then look at the ridiculous behavior around the world we have, weaponizing the dollar and, and, and behaving the way that we do in a very hypocritical manner, according to the rest of the world. But yet this can never happen. It's such a mistake to believe this can never happen, focusing on the bond market, the bond market. The bond market's a joke. And these people know it. They know it. And if you ask me, there's a damn good chance that the bonds are rehypothecated just like the gold is, too. And th this is the rallying cry. And so these countries don't need a common settlement currency right now today that everyone focuses on to disrupt the apple cart. No, you trade with one another in local currencies and you accumulate as much gold as you can. And you are then destroying little by little by little by little the settlement status of the dollar and little by little by little by little the reserve status of the dollar when you exchange treasuries for gold. And I'll tell you what, it's happening. And this goes right back into what I was saying about why it's different this time. The world does not want our bonds and our dollars, not so much because, because of its performance or lackluster performance, but more so because we have proven to the world that if we do not align ideologically with you, you're in trouble. That was the death knell of the dollar. And that's why I keep coming back to the fact, is it too stupid to be stupid? It's planned. And, you know, look, Dunning, and I, I, I don't know, man, I just try and, and put it all together. But when I put it together, it just red lights are flashing. Like, how the hell could this happen? Are they that stupid? No, there's no way they're that stupid. And it's, it's just the same way, like letting the border be wide open. Are they that stupid or could they? No, they're not that stupid, but they're that awful. And, and I think people need to wake up. And the people who I respect a lot, a lot, I'm not going to mention names, I'm sure people know who I'm talking I, I, These are people that have done more for me and I love and I care about and I think they're great. But to focus simply upon recency and normalcy bias and the fact that the bond market is liquid and there isn't anything like it and the dollar is everywhere, so what? Everything comes to an end at some point and to not embrace and realize what is happening right in front of you is just like going to court 
with your attorney and and you're being falsely accused of of of, of murder and your attorney says, we don't need to know the, the the plaintiff's argument. We just need to know your argument. And 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 by not looking at the other side with an open mind, I believe will will be a very, very, very bad decision by a lot of these people in the end when it happens. Yeah, and the way that the uh, defense attorney says that is if he thinks he's got a fix in on the uh, on the judge and on the court and if they've all been bought off and paid off and then he finds out, oh, no, he doesn't anymore. Um, one of the things, uh, this is another anecdote, but I think that this will re resonate with people's lives. They can personally relate to exactly what you're describing is this, what you've described in the past as little by little by little and then all at once, I will call from my engineering career as continuity of operations by incremental run in parallel before a final cutover. So that's a lot of words, but what it means is when you're making a big change from system A to system B and you don't want to risk a huge disruption to continuity of operations, you do it intelligently by making sure that you've got everything in place before you do the final cutover. When you do the final cutover, it's almost trivial. And that people have seen that in their own lives. Look at the Department of Transportation when they're doing major road or highway construction. They don't just shut down the entire road system and then start working on it for two or three years or whatever and you build a new bridge or whatever they, they build it they build the new bridge next to the old bridge they make sure they'll do all the safety inspections they make sure the ramps are all built and then finally on the day of they just close one gate and open the other gate and so for people to say look 99 percent of what i see it still looks the same in the world nothing has changed nothing has changed nothing has changed oh then there's the day that everything changes second second example in information technology, I have a degree in computers, that's what I spent a lot of my career doing it together with manufacturing engineering. In IT, computers, think about it. When a company is putting in a whole new IT system, they can't mess up the comp corporate books for a year while they work out the kinks, so they run in parallel, they build the whole new system up next to the old system, they run the quarterly close, the monthly close, the weekly close, the daily close, the payroll, when everything ties out, they go, okay, we switch over on Sunday night at 9 p.m. We're not using the old system anymore. And if they do it right, nobody even notices the, the switch over. It's almost like it's not with a bang but a whimper. It's you're successful when you do it so well that it's almost in, it, trivial, the final, the final cutover. You don't wait for a big bang cutover. Last example in manufacturing, which is where I spent most of my professional career, uh, we do the same thing. We, you lay the new pipelines, you put the new valves, you put the new process tanks and pressures, you test everything out, and when you're finally ready, you, f you turn one valve, and now the process, the whole manufacturing is going through the new system, not the old system. You just... Dude, I mean, you just so beautifully explained pulled that out of my head because everyone was so bummed out that 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 when Rickard said there'd be a, a new settlement currency in August in Johannesburg and and I you know I've had the, the luxury of spending some time with him right before he made this or right after he made this announcement and talk with him about it and you know he'll be right just like I've been saying forever for two years before he said it that the the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union will will join and and they will the president of Belarus is calling for a summit to make that happen, to join the BRICS. The reason they didn't do it and issue it is exactly what you're saying. They needed to have the infrastructure in place. So 10 countries is impressive. How about 36 countries? How about 46? How about controlling the Red Sea and the Straits of Hormuz, which with, I think it's Congo, I think. My geography is horrible. But when you add in, and I know that they have applied, so when you add in Ethiopia and and, and Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And, you know, they control the Straits of Hormuz. They control the Red Sea. They control the shipping lanes. Look at the infrastructure that is connecting all of the, the bricks with the Belt Road Initiative and the North-South Corridor and all of these things that will allow transportation without interference by the U.S. Navy. It is a massive, massive undertaking that is accelerating. It's been 17 years in the works, but 18, but it's accelerating and you can see things coming together and you're right. And that's why I wasn't bummed out by it. I can see it very clearly. It wasn't time. And in crypto speak, they say mass adoption when the time is right. And that's exactly what you said. People say, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. Well, our media does such a poor job of talking about this stuff that when I talk to people, they don't know what any of this stuff. Let me interject. The media does not do a poor job. The media does an excellent job of not talking about it. Right. They do what they're told. Right. And so 
you we wake up one morning. That's why I've always said on a Sunday night, Monday morning, we we wake up to the all at once moment. I really love how you added color to that, and and it's very, 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 very accurate. And I think that is what is happening under the scenes. And this is why I take exception with people that are smarter than me that that completely poo poo this, because it's a huge mistake. It really, truly is. And and um, that's why I love uh, Luke Gorman. I think Groman is his name, I believe, because. This is a guy that's smarter than the whole room, and he understands what's happening, and he talks about it. And you don't have to to um, think that the 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 rose, the bloom on the rose of the U.S. dollar lasts forever um, to to be right. I, I and 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 you can still be a patriot like I am to understand that we're in trouble, and, and we are. We are in trouble, and you know. So I I just I compliment you very much. It was really interesting what you said. I did want to also mention something just completely off topic if we're done talking about this, um, talking about what gold is doing. And, you know, um, if we if we take a look at, at the last three times that we saw the end of a Fed hiking cycle uh, and the beginning of possible cuts, now I don't think they're going to cut. I've been very consistent at saying that. First they went for three or four cuts and then, well, you know, we'll do it in June. And well, now we may not even do it if inflation stays sticky or whatever. They're a bunch of liars. But let's just talk about what happened the last three times, okay? In June 2000, the Fed completed its last rate hike for that cycle. Gold appreciated 47% in the next four years. In June 2006, the Fed raised rates for the last time in that cycle, and gold rate was 50% higher within two years. In December 2018, the Fed finished the that off that rate hiking cycle, gold was 47% higher by the end of the third quarter 2020. In all three instances, the central bank pushed up the front end rates and then broke something. So is it going to be different this time? Do you see what gold is doing right now? Gold's up 200 bucks. To, to, let's see what it is. It's up eight bucks. It's about 240 or $50 in less than a month. And so this is happening. And and what are they doing to try to hold it back? Well, they're having less success on COMEX because you're having, it's just less success. Let's just say there's not enough metal or whatever it is. Now they're going to the, the lengths of trying to short the ETFs. Some idiot last Friday shorted 12,599,986 shares of SLV last Friday. That's $288 million in one day, one person. Well, silver's up today, and it was up big on Friday. It was up big yesterday, and today it's up. Uh, well, today it's down a few cents, was up. But the point of it is, is that how much money did it cost that person, and who would do something so stupid? Why? These are not normal times. These, are, these aren't. And um, I don't know. I just will tell you in my soul, I truly believe that that – this is going to end up being the beginning of a, of a sustained rally. I hope I'm right. I could be wrong. But to say $3,000 gold by the end of the year and, you know, $35 silver or higher by the end of the year is not outrageous. And I'm never the one to ever come out and say these kinds of numbers. But when you look at the way that it's moving and the strength that is showing and the arbitrage that is going on in, in China and the election and the BRICS meeting coming on at the end of the uh, the year, uh, I think people need to take a step back and, and look at this for what it is. And maybe maybe this time, after all of these years of, of watching them come in and smash the price of gold just when it should be going higher, well, maybe, maybe this time is different. Andy, did you want to add any additional uh, insights that you were referring to earlier about uh, meetings you were having earlier uh, a couple weeks ago and your first arrival in Europe before we let you go? I have some very interesting things to talk about, but I, I haven't quite crossed over the line to be able to talk about it. It'll be very soon, hopefully by next week. Uh, that is, I'm fairly certain. Not a worry. And I uh, want to recap on what our weekly specials are this week so people are aware of that. Yes, we have uh, 2024 Silver Eagles, uh, up to 1,500 of them at 550 over spot. And, you know, Silver Eagles are getting tough to get again. The Mint really hasn't shown that they've made much of anything since March, just a, just a heads up. Uh, One-tenth ounce 
Gold Eagles, $51 over melt value, if I'm not mistaken. Kind of a weird number there. And junk silver, $275, pre-1965 U.S. constitutional silver, $2.75 uh, over spot per ounce. Um, what's really interesting also with all of this, Dunnigan, is that we have we've seen the public selling into this rally. We've seen much slower volume since December of last year into where we are now. We've seen rising real interest rates. We've seen a strong dollar. We've seen talk of a softening economy. We've seen people selling their gold to chase AI and to chase Bitcoin's uh, exorbitant rally and gain. And yet gold continues to march higher. And What's really interesting is that it's done so without really much participation by the American public to the point where the premiums for the last six months have been lower than I've seen in my entire career. And it's starting to change. Um, some of the most competitive companies in America are six and a half bucks or 639 over spot on Silver Eagles if you buy 1500. We are only allowing up to 1500 on this special at 550. Um, but premiums are rising again, and it's starting with the Silver Eagle. So I guess that could be a precursor. But I find it interesting that as the central banks are buying more than at any time in history, China 17 straight months in a row, India buying 400 million ounces of silver in the last two years, and, and their import numbers are up again this year. And the big people who understand are always doing the opposite of the little guy. And that's why most people never actually succeed in investing. They follow the herd and they follow conventional wisdom. But the big money is using that uh, and, and has for quite some time to, to their advantage. So again, I just want people to know that I can't think of a better time in my career, honest to God, ever to be buying gold and silver when the biggest, most sophisticated and well-funded money in the world is doing just that. And the premiums on this side, because the people are always doing the wrong thing in investing, that's why there aren't a million Rick Rules and a million Eric Sprouts. There's just a handful of them because they had the courage to buy when people were selling, to sell when people were buying. And, and, and that's why they're successful. That's what the big money does. They're always ahead of everybody else by two steps. And I'll tell you, the fact that the public is asleep at the switch and heavily invested in traditional assets is maybe the biggest contrarian indicator of my career because the biggest money in the world is also the most well-informed money in the world. And that's why I will tell you, you know, this right here, and I've said it a million times, misdirection, the art of war. It is how to beat your opponent without throwing a punch, and that is exactly what China and the rest of the BRICS nations and the rest of the central banks have been doing, using the suppression to misdirect everyone from gobbling everything up and crowding them out of their own trade, making the equity market a handful of stocks, making all of the traditional assets seem like the place to go, allowing Bitcoin to go to the moon. And I'm not a Bitcoin basher. It doesn't have to be one or the other. But I just want people to know that it's interesting to me that They've completely ignored the media, the, the public fanfare, and, and the retail participation gold that is taking off like a rocket ship. And it's interesting. And I guess I would use that as, as a contrarian indicator and say there isn't, really hasn't been a better time to buy in my career. And I mean that 100%. Well, Andy, we're always grateful for your presence here, especially now after your long absence, and we hope to see you every week and uh, always glad when we can. So thank you for being here with our audience on Liberty and Finance for our weekly market updates and uh, be well. And thank you everyone out there for watching and please spread this widely. It's insight that they're not here. None of our friends, coworkers, neighbors, uh, relatives are hearing from the mainstream financial press by design because it's not that stupid, it's that awful. And uh, Andy, thanks for opening our eyes on this and all other topics. The pleasure is always mine, my man. And I wish you and your entire family and everyone else out there a great rest of the week and look forward to picking up where we left off next week. Blessings to you and to everyone watching. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for April 8th through April 15th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature one ounce 2024 American Silver Eagles at just $5.50 over spot. 
It's a limited supply, so there's a maximum of 1,500 ounces per order. Next, 110 ounce 2024 American Gold Eagles at just $51 over melt. It's also a limited supply, so a maximum of 150 per order. And finally, 90% constitutional silver pre-1965 mixed dimes and quarters at just $2.75 over spot. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.